nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So let's continue our discussion of the thermoelectric transport coefficients by talking about the Seebeck coefficient. This is the second of the four electrical transport coefficients that we'll be discussing. Yeah. Right, the Seebeck coefficient is what is responsible for causing current to flow when there is a temperature gradient. S is known as the Seebeck coefficient. Sometimes it's also called the thermal power. So temperature differences cause current to flow because they cause differences in the Fermi functions of the two contacts. Again, we'll begin with the Landauer expression. In this case, though, the difference in Fermi levels that is causing the current to flow is not coming from a difference, the difference in Fermi functions, which is causing the current to flow, is not coming from a difference in Fermi levels in the two contacts. It's coming from a difference in temperature between the two contacts. So when I subtract F1 minus F2, both of them have the same Fermi level. In this case, we're assuming that to be the case. But the first one has a temperature T1, the second one has a temperature T2. Okay, so I could divide by the change in temperature, and I could multiply by the change in temperature, and I could recognize that I have a finite difference approximation to the derivative of the Fermi function with respect to temperature. Okay, so I could write F1 minus F2 as proportional to minus the derivative of the Fermi function with respect to temperature times the difference in temperature between the two contacts. And now there's some mathematics that I'll leave out. If you take the Fermi function, differentiate it with respect to temperature, you'll see that it is similar to the differentiation with respect to energy, except that you bring down a couple of extra factors. So we bring down an E minus EF over temperature. Okay, so now we have an expression that is valid when we have small differences in temperature between the two contacts, and that's the situation we're interested in. We can plug that approximation for F1 minus F2 into the Landauer expression, and now we have an expression for the current due to a temperature difference across the device. And what we find is that the current is proportional to the temperature difference I'm going to call that constant of proportionality. I'm not going to give it a name. It's the product of the Seebeck coefficient times the electrical conductance. Okay. Okay, now let's do what we did for the electrical conductivity. Let's look at a large bulk sample. Okay. So again, I'm going to assume that I have a very long sample, many mean free paths long, so the transmission is very small, it's just the ratio of the mean free path divided by the length. Again, I'm going to define current flow to be positive when it flows in the positive x direction. Uh, we're going to say that difference in temperature over length L, that's a gradient in the temperature. And we're going to convert these quantities from a conductance and to a uh, conductivity by multiplying by cross-sectional area divided by length. Do that, we convert this expression for the quantity S times G into a macroscopic bulk equation for the current flow. The current, due to a temperature gradient, so the, is minus Seebeck coefficient times conductivity times the gradient of the temperature. And this product of the Seebeck coefficient times the conductivity, we get directly from this Landauer expression it is the differential conductivity that we saw before, but now we have to weight it by energy with respect to Fermi energy divided by charge on an electron divided by temperature. So we have a mathematical expression for a quantity related to the Seebeck coefficient. All right, let's look at that a little more closely. In the last section, we assumed that there was no temperature difference and we, the current was proportional to the electric field. In this section, we assume that there was no electric field, no voltage difference, and we have an expression for the current in terms of the temperature gradient. In general, we have both an electric field and a temperature gradient, so the total current is the sum of the two. 
Now, if I were to do a measurement of a semiconductor sample with a temperature difference across it and open circuit that sample so that no current can flow, I would measure an open circuit voltage. You can solve for the open circuit voltage just by setting J equals zero in this expression. If you do that, you'll find that the open circuit voltage is minus the Seebeck coefficient times the difference in temperature. Okay. So the Seebeck coefficient is a measure of the open circuit voltage across a semiconductor that has a temperature gradient imposed. Now, we can think about what is the sign of the uh, Seebeck coefficient in a very simple way. Here's a semiconductor slab. Let's think about the right side being hot, the left side being cool. Electrons are going to want to diffuse away from the hot side towards the cool side. A voltage will have to develop, a positive voltage will have to develop to pull the electrons back and to stop the current flow and to give us zero current under open circuit conditions. That open circuit voltage is the Seebeck coefficient. Now, because the voltage difference is minus Seebeck coefficient times temperature difference, we conclude that to get the positive voltage needed here to stop the current flow, the Seebeck coefficient for an N-type semiconductor is negative. Similar arguments would tell us that the Seebeck coefficient for a P-type semiconductor is positive. Negative for N-type, positive for P-type. Okay. All right, now there's also a, another physical picture that we can use to develop some intuition into this mathematics. So let's say I have my, I'm showing my two contacts here at two different temperatures, and I'm thinking about some energy in the conduction band, you know, near the bottom of the conduction band where the current is flowing. I've labeled that E sub J. That's the average energy at which current flows in the conduction band near the bottom of the conduction band for a non-degenerate semiconductor. Okay. Now, there will be some probability given by the Fermi function of the first contact that electrons from the first contact will enter that channel. And there will be a different probability from the second contact given by the Fermi function of the second contact that electrons will enter the channel from that end. When there's an equal probability of entering from both ends, we'll have no current flowing and we'll be open circuited. So simply by equating the Fermi functions at the two ends, we can solve for the difference in Fermi levels that is needed in order to make those Fermi functions equal. Remember the hot one will have a spread because it's hotter that will increase the Fermi function at this energy EJ to compensate for that the Fermi energy has to be pulled down so that F1 is equal to F2. That difference in Fermi energies then is just given by a simple expression. It's, it's the average energy at which current flows with respect to the Fermi energy divided by QT. Right. So we have a physical picture for what's going on in the um, Seebeck effect. So here's the mathematical expression that we developed. If we divide by the total conductivity, just to get the Seebeck coefficient, we have an expression now for the Seebeck coefficient. And if you look at that expression, it, this looks like an expression that is computing an average of the energy. It is weighting the energy by the amount of current that flows at that energy, the differential conductivity, and then we're, develop, we're dividing by the integrated total conductivity. So what we have here in this mathematical expression that we derived is that the Seebeck coefficient is simply related to the average energy at which the current flows with respect to the Fermi energy. So we end up with this very simple expression for the Seebeck coefficient. Okay. So if we think about this in a picture, if we have a non-degenerate semiconductor where the conduction band is up here, the current is going to flow near the bottom of the conduction band, but in a non-degenerate semiconductor, the Fermi level is way below the bottom. So the Seebeck coefficient is going to be a large negative number. The magnitude of the Seebeck coefficient is very large. If I think about the other case, a very heavily doped semiconductor, where the Fermi level is deep inside the band, then I know that the current flows 
at the Fermi window, which is right in the middle of the band where there are lots of states, the current flows very close to the Fermi level. There is little difference between the average energy at which current flows and the Fermi level. So the Seebeck coefficient is very small. In a heavily doped semiconductor or a metal, the Seebeck coefficient will be small. In lightly doped semiconductors, the Seebeck coefficient can be quite large. Now we can also just uh, point out the difference in the sign. If I have an n-type semiconductor, we argued that the Seebeck coefficient is negative. Whenever the states that carry the current predominantly are above the Fermi energy, we get a negative Seebeck coefficient. Now in a p-type semiconductor, the Fermi level is above the top of the valence band. The states that carry the current are below the Fermi level. When the states that carry the current are below the Fermi level, we have a positive Seebeck coefficient for a p-type semiconductor. Okay, so just as we sketched electrical conductivity versus Fermi level, we can now sketch Seebeck coefficient versus Fermi level. If what we do is we find that when the Fermi level is well below the conduction band, the magnitude of the Seebeck coefficient is large. As the Fermi level gets closer and closer to the conduction band and then deep inside, the Fermi level gets smaller and smaller, approaching zero. If you compare that to the conductivity versus Fermi level, you'll note that it's just the opposite. You know, the conductivity increases once we get the Fermi level close to the conduction band, and then it just continues to increase. This is going to be important to understand later on when we talk about the figure of merit. Okay, so we have discussed two of the four electrical transport coefficients. We did the conductivity first. Now we understand the Seebeck coefficient. Both of them are closely related to this quantity we call the differential conductivity, which can be directly related to the channels and band structure and scattering physics. Our next transport coefficient is the Peltier coefficient. That's what we'll talk about in the next section.